This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Tonight, on a special edition of Unsolved Mysteries, meet Todd Mueller, an accused con man with a twisted sense of humor. His escapades of bewildered and frustrated police investigators in Honolulu and Chicago. Not content just to break the law, Mueller has mercilessly taunted authorities with a series of practical jokes. Chad Maurer of Madison, Wisconsin, was an active, popular teenager, the all-American boy. Then in 1990, he was found asphyxiated in an abandoned garage in Chicago. What could have taken Chad Maurer to Chicago's seamy south side and ultimately led to his death? As a young single mother, Lorene Roberts was so destitute she felt compelled to put her three children up for adoption. Now she is one of the heirs to a million dollar estate and doesn't even know it. In 1974, the violent murder of their mother ripped apart the nine children of the Vest family. 17 years later, one of them is still missing. Join me for this intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Perhaps you can help solve a mystery. I want to show you. It's just, it's perfect for what you're looking for. 19-year-old Chad Maurer worked in a bike shop in the Midwest college town of Madison, Wisconsin. He was a typical boy next door, a popular, well-rounded athlete who hoped to save up enough money to attend college in Colorado. So, Chad, how are things at the bike shop today? Oh, it's packed. You wouldn't believe it. Oh, really? Have you sold anything yet? Yeah, I sold my first bike. Oh, On the afternoon great. of May 19, 1990, Chad returned home to grab a quick lunch. You know, it's packed over there, so I gotta get going. See ya. Okay, see ya, Chad. It would be the last time Chad's parents would ever see him. Dad, can I borrow some money for gas? Be right out. Okay, thanks. There was nothing about him that was different. I mean, he wasn't on edge. Chad, you want me to get a jacket take with you? No, that's all right, thanks. Bye-bye. You know, he was just so excited about the job, and he had a big smile on his face, as usual. Hold the guy to 20, Chad, okay? okay. Filled up, have a good day, okay? Right Catch you later. Bye. Bye. I was standing right outside, saying goodbye to him and have a good one, you know? I didn't notice anything different either about the, anything in the car, you know? It was kind of cool out that day and stuff. And I just don't think he had any intention to go anywhere or else he would have had a jacket with him. About an hour, an hour and a half later, John needed something at the uh, hardware store that's near the bike shop. Matter of fact, it's two doors down from it. So we headed up to the hardware store, and we noticed the car, Chad's car, was not in the parking lot. So we decided, instead of going to the hardware store, to stop there and see where Chad was. Thank you. George, you know where Chad is? His car's not out front. Well, he better be here. He may have a customer in the back. I knew there was something wrong, but I just couldn't imagine, you know, so we just thought Chad will show up. I hardly slept at all that night. I probably got about five hours sleep, and I got up at 6, and I was too early to start calling the kids, but I started calling kids about 7.30, and nobody knew anything. The last time anybody saw Chad was Friday night at a party for a couple hours, and that was it. The south side of Chicago is one of the roughest neighborhoods in the country. It is just a three-hour drive from Chad's home in Madison, Wisconsin. Two days after Chad was last seen, a 
maintenance worker found Chad's car abandoned in the garage of a south side housing complex. Oh my God. <sighs> Inside the car was Chad Maurer, dead from carbon monoxide poisoning. The Chicago police contacted the Maurers with the tragic news that their son had committed suicide. My system went into shock. My brain went into shock. And I was not thinking until the kids started calling. I don't even know how the kids found out, but the kids started calling, and they were screaming over the phone, did Chad commit suicide? And, well, he died of carbon monoxide. No, no, not Chad, not Chad. Chad had too much going for him. Chad had all his friends, and Chad loved life. Um, Chad was not depressed. Chad was not down. He had all these goals. John, look at Chad's knuckles. Look John and Dolly look viewed Donald. Chad's body for the first time just prior to the funeral. Yeah, look at his face too. It looks they were startled by his appearance. Well, While the Chicago police had said there was no evidence of foul play, the knuckles on both hands had been skinned to the bone, to and there were bruises on his face. Is there anything else we should be aware of here? Well, we did receive his clothing, and that was soiled. Soiled? Yes, would you like to see it? Most definitely. Moments later, Chad's father got his first look at the clothes Chad was wearing when he died. Oh, no, Chad. Front and oh, back. Oh, no, what happened? What happened? He could not understand why there were blood stains on the T-shirt. Now convinced that Chad's death was not a suicide, the Mowers contacted the local authorities. Show you the uh, crime scene photographs that were sent up uh, by the Chicago authorities. Together with Detective David Bon Giovanni, they studied the police report filed in Chicago. John and Dolly immediately noticed yet another suspicious clue. Surrounding Chad in the car. Speaking of item, what the heck is that next to him there? The jacket? Yeah. Chad didn't take a jacket with him, and he didn't own a jacket like that. And you're positive of that? Yes, I'm positive. The parents noted the jacket on the front seat was not a jacket they knew Chad to own. It would be interesting to know the size of the jacket, if it's consistent with uh, Chad's size, or it may give us an idea of the basic build of somebody that may have been in the car with him. Um, it may have given us an idea of where, in fact, the jacket was purchased, which would give us uh, possibly a location, assuming it's a real, not a real common brand. Um, but the parents had pointed out that, photo, that, that article in the photograph, and uh, when I checked with uh, Chicago, <clears throat> Um, uh, they had noted the jacket as well, um, but we're not sure um, um, where, where the jacket was. They were going to check into that. The best thing I can determine was that the jacket remained in the car, and before the car was towed, somebody uh, took the jacket from the vehicle because we couldn't secure it with the window being locked off. So now I wish we had the jacket, but we have no jacket. The autopsy report also suggested that Chad had not taken his own life. The level of carbon monoxide in his body was 74%, a figure much higher than usually found in a suicide. It's my understanding that levels where they're conscious at the time they succumb to carbon monoxide is about 50 to 60%. Levels that get up to about 74 to 80% are more consistent with a person being unconscious or sleeping at the time they succumb to carbon monoxide poisoning. And that's because they have, people naturally have a tendency to breathe deeper and more methodically when they're sleeping than, than possibly when they're awake. The cause of Chad's death was changed from suicide to undetermined. Authorities began a full-blown investigation. Do you have an opinion as to what happened that day? The bike shop owner was quoted in a local newspaper regarding Chad's case. And something or someone spooked him. Nine days later, the shop was vandalized. No other stores in the area were hit. It now appeared that someone was sending a message. The following is a message from the Madison area Crime Stoppers. On October 22, 1990, Chad's story was aired on a local Crime Stoppers program in Madison, and a disturbing scenario emerged. After the broadcast, an anonymous tip alleged that Chad was involved in a drug deal with people who lived in his apartment complex in Madison. These same people had previously lived on the south side of Chicago. We know through our intelligence sources that there is a pipeline of narcotics trafficking from Chicago to Madison. 
Now, there's nothing in Chad's background that would really suggest that he's involved with narcotics. His uh, toxicological analysis came back uh, pure of any narcotics, not even any alcohol. But because of this uh, conduit, there's a possibility that he might have been uh, tricked or enticed uh, in some way uh, to be involved in narcotics and narcotics trafficking. Is it possible that somebody else offered him money? Chad was looking for money, he wanted to move to Colorado. He was hoping to get a couple thousand dollars to go to Colorado for snowboarding and BMX uh, uh, a future. Um, is it possible that somebody offered him $500 to make the trip, and then when they got to Chicago, reneged on that, and, and an altercation occurred, and Chad obviously being the loser of that altercation. Most all of our homicides in Chicago have a common denominator of drugs in it somewhere, whether they're selling it, whether they're fighting over the territory, whether they're using it. Uh, drugs seems to come up in a great majority of our cases. So this is also a reason that we're inclined to lean toward this drug angle a little bit more because we see it so often here. We feel that there are people uh, probably in the Madison area that probably know more than they're coming forward with. And I think probably that's who we're trying to reach out to now because we're not going to know what happened inside that garage unless we know the circumstances surrounding how he got there. And that's what we're really after, I think, at this point. All we know in Chad's case is Chad is dead and he ended up in Chicago. That's all we know in this case and we know he was beaten up. But why was he beaten up? How did he end up in Chicago? There are so many questions, and every day we wake up and we think a different thing that could have happened to Chad. I know it won't bring Chad back, but we cannot rest, and we cannot put Chad to rest until we really have the answers to this case. In 1971, Big Brothers of America opened a chapter in Elkhart, Indiana. Their first little brother was seven-year-old Jeff Fisher. Jeff's big brother was John Novotny, a local salesman and father of a two-year-old daughter. I play shortstop, you? You do? John gave me the companionship that I really needed at that time. Just the fact that this was, you know, an older guy that I could hang around with and not, you know, not have him tell me to go away and, you know, come back later and stuff. Some, you know, a guy that wanted to spend some time with me, you know, made me feel really good. So I yeah. get this tied up and then we're just about ready. After Jeff and John started seeing each other, I noticed that Jeff had a lot more confidence in himself. And he was very proud of the fact that he had a big brother. And, and he would tell the other kids, well, well, John and I are going to go do this, or my big brother and I are going to go do this. He was very proud of the fact that, that he had a, a, a man in his life. I think it's ready to light? Yeah. OK. A year and a half later, John and his family moved away. Although Jeff never saw John again, he never forgot the warmth and kindness that changed his life. He just introduced me to a world that I had never seen before. And if I finally see him again, I just want to thank him. He, he made a lasting impression. It's been 20 years, and he's still a really vivid part of my memory. Thanks to our viewers, Jeff Fisher's search for his big brother ended the night of our broadcast. Nine days later, Jeff and his mother traveled to John Novotny's home in Tacoma, Washington for an emotional reunion. There they are. <laughs> there they are. Oh my God. Thank you. Yes, nice to meet you. I can't believe we were here.
<laughs> yeah, you look just like your picture, man. <laughs> Great. Great. It's unbelievable. I was absolutely stunned. I had absolutely no idea that Jeff was looking for me. And then as the show aired, uh, people from Elkhart and from Michigan started calling me on the phone, telling me that I was on television and, and that Jeff Fisher was looking for me. And we must have got 35 calls that night and at least that many the next night. You know, I've been wanting to say thanks to this guy for 18 years and, you know, whatever it took to uh, come out and say that, you know, I was willing to do. This is when we were down in Lexington, Kentucky for a John Mellencamp show. When I first started being a big brother, the question was, would I really have enough time to do it right? And then 20 years later, to find out that I really did make a difference, I mean, it brings the whole thing to reality. <laughs> Estimates of their numbers go as high as three million in the United States alone. Sadly, many of us tend not to see the individuals in the faceless mass. We forget that for each man, woman, and child on the streets, there's an untold story. There is no apartment. This is the story of a woman named Lorene Roberts who may be lost among the homeless. Her family has not seen or heard from her in more than 30 years. Lorene has no way of knowing that she is one of the heirs to a million dollar estate. Lorene grew up in Dripping Springs, Texas. She was on the high school basketball team and a member of the pep club. But at 16, Lorene inexplicably dropped out of school. Her family believes this may have been the beginning of a slow descent into mental illness. Lorene was very quiet. She would just be to herself with her own thoughts and her own world. It's as if she wasn't there with you most of the time. Hey, little lady, can we get some coffee over here? Yeah, you the pretty one. You want to take our order? Uh, I'll be with you. In 1949, just after she dropped out of high school, Lorene moved to Austin and soon found work as a waitress. She also found love. Coffee, pie, and how about I take you for a whirl? I don't know what you mean. Let me show you. Just 10 days after they met, Lorene and the young serviceman were married. Lorene and her husband had three children in quick succession. In 1956, they moved to his hometown in New Jersey. That decision would prove to be the undoing of the young couple. Lorene told me that she wasn't happy there. His family didn't accept her. And that his mother bought her and the children a, a train ticket and put them on the train to come back to Austin, sent her back to Austin. Lorene's husband filed for a divorce. With no money and no means of support, Lorene and her three young children returned to Texas and an uncertain future. I'm tired. When are we going to go home? Awesome. Michael, sweetheart, would you put this on for me? That other one's dirty. Come here, put this on for mommy. OK? I'm hungry. Who's, who's going to feed There's us? There's in the kitchen, OK? I need, you, I need you to help me out. Mother! Can you do that? But who's going to take care of us? You, I need you to be the man while I'm gone. Is that OK? Can you do that? Will you be in charge for mommy? Will you do that for me? All right, I got to go now. I got to go. Will you watch after them for me, OK? OK? OK. Bye. Lorene tried. She worked, and she tried to handle, you know, her situations. And she loved her children very much. But. That was just something she couldn't handle, and she's seen she couldn't handle it. And she tried to get help from her husband, but no help. She got no help. 
she decided the best thing to do was to just give them up and let them be adopted out where they would be taken care of. Come along. Now, just get into the car. Now, don't, now don't fuss. I will get, we'll get you some food. Now, don't fuss. I want you to sit there quietly. Yes. After the children were adopted, Lorene's emotional state grew increasingly fragile. She came to me and uh, she, she admitted that she was sick to me and said she needed help, said she needed a doctor. And my dad said, Ruby, take her to the psychiatrist, and I did. And he gave her admit admittance to the state hospital. So I took her out there. And she cried and everything when she hugged my neck and loved me and, and everything. And it was so hard to see, to have to leave her there. Between 1957 and 1961, Lorene was admitted to the state mental hospital on five separate occasions. Each time she was released, she found work as a waitress. But each time when the pressure became too great, Lorene would check herself back into the hospital. In 1959, on one of her furloughs from the state hospital, Lorene showed up at Ruby's house unannounced. Lorene! Honey, it's so good to see you. Get up here and let me give you a big old hug. Oh, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just fine, Ruby. Well, you look thin. Can I fix you something to eat? Oh, no, 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 nothing. I, I can only stay a few minutes. Well, then sit down here and tell me what's been going on. Well, I'm getting married. Married? Uh -huh. That's great. Who to? College professor. A college professor. Well, that's great. I came to show you my ring. Well, that's mighty pretty, honey. Where'd you meet a college professor? That's pretty, isn't it? Laureen, mm -hmm. where'd you meet a college professor? The college. At that time, I was just hoping the best for her. So I didn't question too much or anything. I just hoped the best, you know. And that's the last time I've saw Lorene, and I haven't heard from her or anything since. Well, I gotta get going. Well, can I take you somewhere? Oh, no, no, I came in a cab, and I'm gonna leave in a cab. Take care now. Okay, you too. Two weeks later, Ruby received Bye -bye. a bill for Lorene's engagement ring. Lorene had bought the ring herself and failed to make the payments. We have searched everything looking for Lorene. All the public records have been searched. No one has any records of Lorene uh, being alive for the last 25 years. Her mother died in 1988, and her will provided for the distribution of her estate, which was valued at about a million dollars, to her children. And Lorraine was one of the children. And so since no one knew where she was, the court appointed me to represent her and to try to locate her. I don't think it's going to be easy to find Lorene, but I also don't think she's disappeared off the face of the earth. I think she's out there somewhere. Uh, she's either on the street or in a hospital or under some new identity, but I think she's out there. There's a big void in our life without her. And not knowing whether she's alive or dead, then we want that filled. I would share her children that have found us and her grandchildren. That would be the first thing I'd want her to know about. She would be so happy. When we aired the story, we never imagined that Lorene would call our telecenter and solve her own mystery. Lorene's family was overjoyed to learn that she was alive and well. Her sister Ruby immediately flew to Little Rock, Arkansas, where Lorene had been working as a housekeeper for just room and board. A few days later, Ruby brought Lorene back home to Austin, Texas for a poignant reunion with the rest of her family. It was unbelievable. I could hardly believe it because I guess for so long we had searched and searched for her and we couldn't find a lead. I was so enthused, I just, I cried. 
I laughed. I did everything. Yes, it's getting nice to be back. They're real nice. They've always been. They're original people that said that are very darling people. After we filmed this reunion, Loreen remained in Austin for three months. She received her $105,000 inheritance and has since returned to her home in Arkansas. This is the wonderful person we looked for for 30 years. We're going to try to be happy and just do all the things we can to be together and love each other and, and include her children and her grandchildren. <laughs> and which I think will be real good for Lorraine and all of us. August 29th, 1990, the Hawaiian island of Maui. A man arrived at a local bank and introduced himself as Pepito de Baia. I've been named representative to my aunt's estate. And what I'd like to do is take the funds from her account and open up a new account. In addition to the $52,000 from her account, I'd like to deposit this check also. Do you have some identification? And also, I'd like to transfer $20,000 to my associate in Honolulu. Julian Billamont. I see. That's 20000 to... Julian Billamont. Although the documents appeared in order, something about the smooth-talking customer put the bank manager on guard. I tell you what, all this is going to take some time. If you could come back in an hour, we'll be all ready for you to go when you come back. OK. Great. And I guess I'll see you in around an hour. Yes, thank you, okay. Mr. DeBayan. Thank you. So long. An hour later, Pepito de Bayon returned to schedule. Hi. Are you Pepito de Bayon? Yeah, that's me. We believe this check is a forgery. De Bayon was arrested on the spot for suspicion of forgery. Turn to your right. At first, Maui police had no idea who they had in custody. The suspect carried 15 identification cards, each with a different alias. Eventually, authorities identified their prisoner as an elusive con man named Todd Mueller. Todd Mueller is not your run-of-the-mill criminal. He specializes in forging court documents, which give him free reign to plunder the estates of the recently deceased. His many escapades have confused and frustrated authorities, often leaving them shaking their heads in disbelief. As it turns out, Todd Mueller is something of a practical joker who delights in taunting those who are trying to keep him behind bars. December 3rd, 1991, Honolulu, Hawaii. My name is Clara. Hi, Clara, how are you? I'm Arthur Ayala. Three months after his arrest in Maui, Todd Mueller was out on bail and back on the scam, calling himself Arthur Iona. What may I do for you today? Well, Clara, I've been a personal representative to the estate of George McLaughlin. And what I'd like to do is take the funds from this account and open a checking account in my name. May I see some ID? Absolutely. We think Todd Mueller looked in a newspaper in the obituary section. From there, he would get names of uh, deceased persons, their accounts being in probate court. He would then go over to the copying machines located right in circuit court, take these photocopies home, and he would make up letters of administration naming him the trustee for the account. The fictitious documents and phony checks enable Mueller to steal thousands of dollars from banks throughout Hawaii. He had created a lucrative cottage industry right in his own apartment but his work was sometimes less than perfect. One particular check, the bank listed on the check, was a bank of Iowa, Boise, Iowa. There is no Boise, Iowa. Instead, it should be Boise, Idaho. And we thought that was pretty hilarious with him, you know, just making up any name. I guess he didn't realize it was Boise, Idaho. 
Todd Mueller was not only a bit sloppy, he was greedy. During the next three days, he returned to the bank in Honolulu and withdrew more than $31,000, arousing the suspicions of yet another bank manager. She called me to tell me that she thought these probate documents were false. She described the individual to me. I immediately thought Todd Mueller. Mr. Mueller? Todd Mueller? Detective Labrigo. Yeah, finally me. All right, you're under arrest for forgery. Chance be on your back. After the arrest, Detective Nobriga proceeded to an address given him by Mueller. Once he determined that Mueller did live there, Nobriga left to obtain a search warrant. Okay, this is it. Meanwhile, Todd Mueller posted bail warrant. and was released. Todd Mueller calls me in my office. He invites me over to his house. He, he tells me, you don't have to make any search warrants. Just come over to my house and I'll let you look around. I just kind of smiled and thought, well, he's leading me on a wild goose chase. I walked over and checked with some of the neighbors, and they had told me just about an hour before I arrived there, there was a flurry of activity where guys were moving stuff out of the house, throwing it onto a truck, and they took off and left. One week later, at the Oahu Correctional Facility, a former cellmate of Todd Mueller's, Roy Hartsock, received a welcome surprise. Yo, pack your stuff up, man. Today's your lucky day, being paroled. What? Be paroled. Pack your stuff up. Nah, I, I don't get paroled until February. A court order had been issued for Hartsock's immediate release. Roy Hartsock left the island for parts unknown. Three weeks later, authorities discovered that Hartsock's release documents had been forged. Todd Mueller had apparently struck again. At about the time we are looking for Todd Mueller, I got a phone call from a New York police sergeant saying that they had arrested Todd Mueller in New York. When I tried to call this New York sergeant back, we learned that there was no such person, no such department there in New York. And where was Todd Mueller? Living it up at an exclusive hotel in Chicago, Illinois. Hi, it's 1720. I want to pay for tonight, tomorrow. I'm not sure when I'll be checking out. Mr. Mueller? We became suspicious of Mr. Mueller because of the activity that was taking place in the lobby. He had very suspicious looking people coming to the hotel and he was uh, giving large sums of money. Uh, to them, and I informed the front office manager that we should not extend this stay. The hotel's booked? That's correct. Are you sure there isn't some mistake? I've been here all week. I'm afraid not. We have a convention coming in. The entire floor is booked. I see. Mueller, however, wasn't quite ready to leave. I guess in that case, I'll be checking out. He simply Thank called you. the hotel's toll-free reservation service and booked another room across the hall. That irked me, <laughs> uh, to say the least. And at that point, that's when I felt that uh, we should uh, take some sort of action as to at least check on his identity of who Mr. Mueller actually was. Pat Amiano searched Mueller's vacated room. He found several discarded checks, which later proved to be forgeries. Amiano also discovered that Mueller had placed several calls to Honolulu, Hawaii. On the off chance, he called one of the phone numbers, and it happened to be my office. I think he just has this penchant for uh, making everyone chase him around. You know, I guess he's sort of like uh, cops and robbers kind of thing. When Chicago police arrived to arrest Mueller, they were met by his former cellmate from Hawaii, Roy Hartsock. We're looking for Todd Mueller. He's not here. And you are? Hartsock? Hartsock was surprised to learn that his early release from prison had been secured with forged documents. Do you have any identification? Yeah. Todd Mueller? Chicago PD, you're under arrest. Once again, Todd Mueller was in custody, but this time there would be no bail. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can be used against you in a court of law. Do you understand that? 
Yes, I do. Tad was parading around town prior to his arrest, pretending to be someone other than what he was, committed several burglaries, stole mail, federal mail theft charges, opened bank accounts, and attempted to withdraw some of $204,000 from one account. Roy Hartsock was returned to Hawaii to complete his sentence. Todd Mueller was booked on charges of forgery, fraud, and robbery. He was held in the Cook County Jail pending trial. But Mueller had one more trick up his sleeve. After six months behind bars, he was rushed to a hospital emergency room after telling guards he had swallowed a razor blade. Mueller was handcuffed to his hospital bed. A guard was posted outside the door. It didn't do a bit of good. Authorities still cannot explain how Todd Mueller got away. Since Todd Mueller escaped, people would call me just to say that he wanted to turn himself in to me. Some of his phone calls claimed to be on the, the plane itself coming into Hawaii, saying that I'm on my way in, I'm on so-and-so flight. Why don't you meet me at the airport? To go down there, he's never there. I don't think my sense of humor is uh, any, the, any worse for it. Uh, I don't particularly enjoy what he's doing, but I just think what he's doing is silly. You know, eventually, he's going to get caught. Next, a woman's poignant search for her brothers and sisters, torn apart by tragedy. James and Wanda Vest were married in 1956. 17 years later, they had nine children, six sons and three daughters. The oldest child was 16, the youngest just 10 months. James worked in the construction business, and for the Vest children, life at home seemed safe and secure. dinner every night together at the table. My mother would have everything done before my father got off work. Christ our Lord. Amen. Good. My mother sat at one end, my father sat at the other end, and the, the kids sat on the sides. And um, I think that was something that was really important to my father, you know, that the family be together at dinner time and sit there and eat. Yeah. OK, begin. We had an ideal life. We would go to church on Sundays. We would get up on the stage of the church and sing with my mother because she played the accordion. Um, we would sing at home together. We would have fun. It, it was typical American family life that you see on Leave it to Beaver. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. In May of 1974, the Vest family was ripped apart by tragedy. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Wanda Vest had died on her 34th okay, so birthday. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I think I felt more cheated than anything. I remember my little sister tried to touch my mother, and I pulled her hand back. And then she went up there, and I guess she touched her because she came back, and she goes, Sissy, why is Mama so cold? And I couldn't answer her. I didn't know what to say, so I just sat her down on my lap and just held her there. Now prepare us the table before me. James Vest did not attend the funeral. He was in jail charged with the murder of his wife. My cup overflows. What could bring a man to kill his own wife and leave his children as orphans? 
The answer in this isolated case may be hauntingly simple. James Vess was an alcoholic. The nine Vest children not only lost both of their parents to this devastating disease, they also lost each other for 17 years. This is a story of one woman's determination to find her brothers and sisters, and one family's resilience in the face of overwhelming tragedy. By 1973, years of drinking binges has steadily eroded James and Wanda Vess's marriage. James was often too drunk to work. He also became increasingly violent towards his wife. Wanda? Yeah? Hey, Wanda, where's that bottle? I remember on one occasion, my father coming home looking for his bottle of liquor. And my mother had hid it, so he couldn't find it. No, I didn't. You hid that bottle, Wanda? You probably I didn't drink the bottle. It was a full bottle this morning. Where the hell is it? And he got really upset and wanted his liquor. And when my mother wouldn't give it to him, he was beating her up. And he was hitting her and choking her. And so my brothers would go over there and try to get him off of her. I was always more quiet and afraid. Wanda Vess had finally had enough. James soon moved out of the house, and Wanda filed for divorce. She was determined to make a new life for herself and the nine children. But with no formal training and little work experience, Wanda was forced to wait tables and tend bar at a local tavern. May 27, 1974. At around 1 a.m., James Vest wandered into the tavern where his wife worked. It was Wanda's 34th birthday. Well, I just came to buy a drink for your birthday, babe. I don't want anything from you. We do this every year. Get out. According to witnesses, James had been drinking heavily. Approximately an hour later, James Vess was arrested at a nearby tavern. Minutes after killing Wanda, James had swaggered into the bar and openly boasted that he had just shot his wife. He said he needed a drink. Vess later pled guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison where he died in 1983. In one senseless and violent moment, James Vess had shattered his entire family. Within days of their mother's funeral, the Vest children were sent to live in separate homes. I think for some reason, I felt we had enough family that some kind of way we would all be kept together, but I was wrong. It was like nobody wanted us. We were taboo, you know. To, to be around us would be to remember what happened, to have to accept it, and they didn't want that. So to me, we were punished for what my father did because we weren't even allowed to have each other. The oldest boy, James Jr., was taken in by his grandmother. Shireen and three brothers, Russell, Kenneth, and Wayne, were placed in foster homes. Her sister, Kendra, and the three youngest children, Heath, Dawn, and Kevin, were put up for adoption. Excuse me, do you have any spare change? For 14-year-old Shireen, the tragic loss of her entire family marked the beginning of a cycle of despair. Just three months after her mother was murdered, Shireen ran away from her foster home and took to the streets. In the very beginning, sometimes I would sleep in the apartment building hallway, and a couple times I slept outside. It was cold, I was scared. I had a backpack that had some clothes in it, I used that for a pillow. You lay there and halfway sleep and hope that no one comes around.
Remarkably, Shireen managed to escape the streets. Eventually, she enrolled in business school and later got a job as an office manager. Today, Shireen lives in San Diego, California with her husband and two daughters. Four years ago, with the love and encouragement of her new family, Shireen began searching for her missing brothers and sisters whom she had not seen in 11 years. Incredibly, it took Shireen less than two months to find four of her brothers. Two years later, she was reunited with her oldest sister, and just last Christmas, Shireen finally made contact with her youngest sister and brother. But one of the Vest children still remains unaccounted for. Shireen's brother Heath, who was six years old when they were separated. I actually had a dream one night that there was all nine of us in a room, and I was actually going, Jimmy, I counting them all down the line, and I, I couldn't believe it. It's like something that you want, but it's just out of reach. You'll never get it. But I believe enough, and I that because I will not take no for an answer. Is I just know that I'm going to get them all together. The night of our broadcast, Shireen's dream of finding her brother Heath came true when he called our telecenter. Heath, who is now married and living in Ohio, was shocked to learn he'd been featured on national television. The next day, Heath spoke with his sister for the first time in more than 17 years. Four weeks later, Heath, accompanied by his wife Robin, arrived in Los Angeles for a special reunion with five of his brothers and sisters. I was, I was really excited. I just wanted to get out of the car. You know, I was thinking, you know, who am I going to hug first, you know? And I didn't want anybody to start bawling or anything, you know? I just wanted to get out and hug everybody at once, basically. Uh, when I heard Heath was found, I was actually kind of numb. I thought it would take months. I didn't know that people would just call in and it would be that easy. <laughs> um, I'm glad it was, because it's been a long wait. <laughs> Meeting everybody, it's changed my attitude a lot. It's picked up my attitude because, uh, you know, I've had a lot of uh, feelings. You know, I had that uh, unwanted feeling, and uh, I, I never really knew why. But now, now since uh, they found me, I have that wanted feeling now. And, uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good feeling, because uh, I never really knew. Finding Heath and this reunion is the first day of a new beginning. I know when we all leave here that we're all going to leave here differently. It's going to be better for all of us. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, the final appeal of Larry Race. In 1982, Race took his wife for a moonlight boat ride on Lake Superior. The next morning, Debbie Race's lifeless body washed ashore. Larry Race was convicted of murder and sent to prison. To this day, Race maintains his innocence, and the family of his dead wife believes he is telling the truth. At the outbreak of World War II, a young woman of the Ojibwe Indian Nation was banished by her father when she joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. Her brothers and sisters have not seen her in nearly 50 years. Join me next time for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.